Hello, hope you're having a great week and a great weekend. Uh, we're continuing to take a look at how God wants us to better live for Jesus. Uh, living on the earth as Jesus would live on the earth, loving as he would love, praying as he would pray. And today we get to look at, at Paul's favorite prayer and, and my favorite prayer of Paul. He tells us this is the reason why he prays. And we're going to get into that. We're in Ephesians 3. Last week, in the first 13 verses of Ephesians 3, we looked at how God wants to make known the manifold insight into his spiritual eternal purpose through the church. Uh, it's eternal. Yeah, we live three score and ten or by reason of strength four score, 70 or 80 years. And maybe some people you know longer. I had a funeral for a fellow that was 109 and two-thirds, okay? Uh, didn't quite make 110. Uh, but th this life is very temporary for us. But he says there's an eternal life. And that's why we pray. Because you are eternal. You're going to live forever. That's not a question. The question is location, location, location. Where do you want to live forever? There's one place typified by the word with. We call it heaven. There's another place typified by the word hell, uh, by the word alone, and we call it hell. And so I want us to take a look here at, at how to pray. And that'll be in, starting in Ephesians 3, verse 14. The reason why Paul bends his knee to the Father. He's already prayed for them the before. In, in chapter 1, he prayed for them uh, that they would have insight and understanding. It was mostly a prayer of thanksgiving. Uh, he was thankful for their faith and their hope and their love, and he wanted them to understand their hope so that they could grow in it and understand the, the, the significance of, of what Christ had done for them so they could live more fully for him. Well, here he's going to continue that more specifically in just praying for them to understand the absolute love of God. All right? So that'll be in chapter 3, starting verse 14. But before we get there, we need to pray. So let's pray. Dearest, loving Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you for loving us, for letting your Son give his life for us. What a terrible and wonderful sacrifice. We owe you more than we could ever give. Help us to give all that we can from our hearts, completely from our hearts, to you. In your son Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, Paul's talking to the church in Ephesus and the other churches probably that received this letter as well in the first century. And uh, he starts in verse 14. It says, chapter 3, verse 14 of Ephesians. He says, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Okay, he says, I want you, everybody, I bow my knee before the Father, and this is why. The reason why I pray is the Father Everyone comes from a father. Every family in heaven on earth comes from God. God created the angels. He created the people. He created everything and everyone. And so he says, here's my request, that according to the riches of his glory, okay, if Bill Gates gave you something according to his riches, it would be different than if I gave you something according to my financial riches. But trust me. Okay, it'd be a whole lot more. And, and so God, his riches are way beyond anything that any man on earth, any corporation on earth, any organization on earth cannot imagine the riches of God. He owns everything. He made everything. All right? According to the riches of his glory. This is not riches of financial wealth. This is riches of the glory of God. In 1 Timothy 6, verse 16, he dwells in unapproachable light. The glory of God. He is holy, holy, holy. Yes, he's love. It tells us in 1 John 4, 8 that God is love. But it tells us in Isaiah 6, it tells us in Revelation 5, that God is holy, holy, holy. He's really holy. Okay? And, and so, he, according to the riches of his glory, he can grant you me? 
I'm just a little two-legged creature down here, and I sin and fall short of the glory of God. We all do. But he says here, to grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. When you died to your old life that you used to live before you became a Christian, and you were buried with Christ by baptism into death, it says you were raised up and you received not just the forgiveness of your sins, you received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Who is in you? The Spirit here, who is in you? In your inner being. Verse 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. See, the Holy Spirit lives in you so Christ can live in you. <clears throat> See, Christ is so holy he can't look on sin and so he had to forgive us. And after he forgave us, then his spirit could live in us. And when his spirit lives in us, then he can live in us. And so Christ gets to live in you because the spirit's living in you. Christ does not live in you if the spirit doesn't live in you. So people think, oh no, the spirit doesn't live in you. Well, it says here he does. And in fact, it says Christ lives in you because the spirit lives in you. Okay. So that this Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what's the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Of all the things you need to know, of all the things I need to know, job one, know the love of God. If I can understand how much he loves us and I can understand how he loves us, the depth of his love, the width of his love, the breadth of his love, the height of his love. There's no love like his. You know, Romans 5, For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet perhaps for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Right? I, was, I wasn't worth dying for. We say, well, everybody loves me because I'm so lovable. No, Christ doesn't love you because you're lovable. We sin and fall short of the glory of God. All of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags, Isaiah 64, verse 6. We don't deserve his love, but he loves us. Okay, I remember one morning, had a little baby boy, and I was trying to help my wife out. So it was Saturday, and I didn't have to go to work that day. So I got up and washed him up and diapered him and while I was diapering him after I had had my shower and after I had gotten cleaned up, he decided he wanted to wet down my shirt and pants because he's just a little baby and he didn't know any better. So I handed off the baby and went back and changed my pants and changed my shirt. And uh, then a little later on that day, uh, Kathy had fed him and, and I was going to burp him so that he wouldn't, and I had a little burp rag so that he wouldn't, you know. He decided to do more than that burp rag could hold, and so he wiped out another shirt. Okay, so I'm on my third shirt and my second pair of pants, and it's still early in the morning. So we're sitting down at the table at breakfast, and I'm holding him on my lap, and we're talking, and that was back before Pampers. Well, they might have been Pampers, but we had cloth diapers, and sometimes it didn't hold things well around the legs, and so he got another pair of pants and another shirt. That's three pair of pants and four shirts, and it's not even 10 o'clock in the morning. Now, I didn't quit loving him. He's my son. I love him with all my heart. God doesn't love you because you're lovable. He doesn't love you because you don't mess up. You mess up. We're like that baby. We mess up a lot. But he still loves us. How deep is his love? Deeper than the love of a mother. Deeper than the love of a father. And I'll tell you this one. Deeper than the love of a grandparent. I have 10 grandkids. I love them with all my heart. And I'll tell you another one. Deeper than love of a great-grandparent. I've got a little great-grandson. He's wonderful. The most beautiful little baby you ever saw in your life. Grandkids are great. 
great grandkids are really great, all right? And he's just amazing. I love him with all my heart. God loves you more. How? It's so deep. It's so wide. He doesn't just love you. He loves everyone. His love is wide. His love is high. It wants to take you up to be with him. It wants to glorify you and purify you. It wants to make you the bride of Christ, the body of Christ. He wants, he wants to, how high is the love of God? How wide, how deep, how long is the love of Christ? Okay? My kid messed up once. He messed up twice. He messed up, messed up four times before 10 o'clock in the morning. So I'm going to quit loving him. No, he's my son. I love him. God loves you. How long is his love? I've messed up before God more than four times. So have you. But he forgives us. Why? Because he loves you. One of the verses that I think clearly shows the love of God, maybe more... more specifically than maybe any other passage. In Isaiah 53, verse 10, in the story of the, in the last of the four servant songs in Isaiah, he says in verse 10, it says, And God was pleased to crush him. Talking about Jesus, the lamb that went before his shearers, silent before his shearers, opened on his mouth. He laid on him the iniquity of his soul. It says, God was pleased to crush him if he had rendered his life as a guilt offering. That's his only begotten son. And God was pleased to crush him if it would bless you. I can't imagine a love like that. If we had not seen it displayed in Jesus, if we had not seen it predicted in Scripture, if we had not seen it fulfilled in Scripture and in history, and in the lives of all those around us we know who are following Jesus with all their hearts, we wouldn't have believed it. You couldn't make up somebody like Jesus. I mean, there's Superman and there's all these, uh, you can't make up Jesus. He walked on water. He healed blind people, raised people from the dead after four days when his sister says, my Lord stinketh. And he, his God's only begotten son, God was pleased to crush him if it allowed you to be with God. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. That's the heart we need to be having all the time. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord. Okay, so he says, so that you can comprehend with all the saints what's the breadth and length and depth and height and know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge. Okay? Uh, the knowledge of the knowledge of the love of God is what, the verse really says in the Greek, okay? Uh, this is surpassing, surpassing knowledge. This is like, there's nothing like this. There's nothing in this category. Jesus is a whole new category, and the love of Jesus is a whole new category. How could he kneel in the garden and pray, Father, if it's at all possible, let this cup pass from me? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. How could he do that? I need to know the love of God. When I know the love of God, I live better. I love my wife better. I love my neighbors better. I bless the people around me better the more I know the love of God and the more I understand the love of Christ. And so he says, I'm praying that you understand the love of Christ because when you really understand the love of Christ, you don't want to sin. I don't want to put any more anguish on Jesus that he's already had to endure. Sometimes I still do. Sometimes you still do. We all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But it should break our hearts when we do. And then we should be filled with joy because of his continuing love and his continuing forgiveness. So he says, to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You want to be filled up with God? You've got to know the love of Christ first. Learn the love of Christ. Read Matthew, read Mark, 
read Luke, read John. Take your time. Don't try to see how fast you can get through them. Look at Jesus. See him. Read the fifth gospel. I like to call Isaiah 40 through 66 the fifth gospel because there is a lot of the character of Christ revealed in the last portion of Isaiah that you can't find in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look at Christ there. He's amazing. Look at him in Hebrews. Look at him in the letters of Paul. Look at him in the letters of John. The love of Christ is amazing, and our job is to be amazed because we live better when we're amazed. So he finishes off the prayer by saying, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power that is at work within us. How much can God do? Exceedingly, abundantly, beyond all that we ask or even think. God can do a lot, can he? I can think a lot, okay? I can imagine a lot. He can do more than we can imagine, more than we can think exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think. That's a lot of love. That's a lot of power. God's power. He's able to do far more abundantly than anything. Could he take 12 fishermen and tax collectors and change the whole world? Yeah, because he did. Could he die on the cross and then rise from the dead on Sunday morning just by the power of a sinless, indestructible life? Yeah, because he did. Okay? He's absolutely amazing. And I need to understand that, that he can do all that stuff. Now, I left out one little part of that. Notice what the last part? According to the power that's at work within us, All those amazing things God can do, he can do through you. What did Jesus say to his disciples before he departed? He says, you'll do greater miracles than these. Well, <laughs> no, wait, that's not, that's not possible. He raised the dead after four days. Nobody raised the dead after five. He fed 5,000 with a boy's lunch. Nobody fed 6,000 with a boy's lunch. I mean, he walked on water. Nobody walked on air. I mean, how do you beat his miracles? Everybody he fed got hungry again. Everybody he healed got sick again. Everybody he raised from the dead died again. Because they're physical. What does it say in 2 Corinthians uh, 4 verse 18? That which is seen, he says, we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are unseen. For the things which are seen are temporal, and the things which are unseen are eternal. When you were dead in your trespasses and sins, according to Ephesians 2, verse 1 and 2, he made you alive. You're still alive. And if you keep serving Jesus the rest of your life, you're going to always be alive. Yeah, you're going to sin while you do it. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, continually cleanses us from all sin. He keeps on cleansing you from sin. It's amazing. So he says, he's able to do all those things according to the power that's at work in you. When you teach somebody about Jesus and they're dead in their trespasses and sins and they're born in Christ, all their sins are washed away, they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, they become a part of the body of Christ, they're out telling others about that, they become part of the story that never ends, don't they? That's eternal. And that's better than just feel, healing them, raising them from the dead physically because you raised them from the dead eternally because you showed them Jesus. You showed them the love of Christ. By this will all men know you're my disciples if you have this love one for another. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And if we know the love of Christ, look at the power that's able to be accomplished through us. It doesn't say through angels. It says, through you. Angels wish 
they even knew what we already have. In fact, it says in 1 Peter 1, verse 12, it says, angels long to look into these things. They get to be servants of God. We get to be children of God. And he says, they long to look into it. We get to have that. It's amazing. We have been, remember chapter 2, verse 6? We have been raised up and seated together with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. That's pretty good. I like that. I like that a lot. And so he says here, according to him who's able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power that's at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Well, is that a mistake? He doesn't say, when he says to him be glory for all ages, world without end, he doesn't say through Christ and the church. No, he didn't. What did he say? He said, through the church and Christ Jesus, to him be glory for all ages, world without end. Why give top billing to the church? I know us. He's sinless. We fall short. He said, you're going to do greater things than I've done. You're going to do greater things than these. Why? How? How many years did Jesus get to serve in the flesh? 33. How many years is he getting to serve in the spirit? Through you, through me, through the church. To him be glory for all ages, world without end. You see, he served for three, he's been serving through the church for almost 2,000, and he's not done yet. The church continues to be the body of Christ. Jesus is still walking on the earth. It's just sometimes he looks like you. You're living for Jesus. That's your job. That's my job. I don't do it as well as I should. I need to do it better. I'm trying. Oh, I says I'm very trying. But anyway, I'm trying to live like he is. And some days I do that better than others. But I always do it by his power, not by mine. When I think I do it by my power, I don't do it very well. I need to do it by his power. But it says, according to the power that's at work within you, to him be glory for all ages, world without end, through the church and Christ Jesus. Forever and ever. Okay, that's a lot of forever. Okay, that's forever and forever. It says, literally, through this age and through all the ages, is what it says. Uh, Christ is going to keep on working through the church. The 12 gates will always be open. The body of Christ is always going to be that family of believers that does amazing things on the earth. How did, how could anyone have known that 12 fishermen and tax collectors were going to turn the world upside down? Well, really, it was already upside down, and they were turning it right side up, right? And so that's the prayer. Now, how are we as the body of Christ going to be able to accomplish all this glorifying of God that we're supposed to be doing? Can we do it when we all fuss with each other? Well, you don't hold all the same opinions I do. You don't have all the same doctrines I do. You don't have all, so you're not right. I'm right. No, you're not right either. I'm wrong. Doctrinally. I'm wrong. So are you. What we need to understand is that we will never get the job of Christ done on the earth while we're fussing with each other. That's why in chapter 4, he begins the pragmatic instructional portion of the book of Ephesians by telling us the first thing we need to do And the first thing we need to do is get along together. Be united. Be one. Quit fussing with each other. Yeah, they're different from you. And you're different from them. And they fall short. And so do you. Some of the things they believe are wrong. Some of the things you believe are wrong. In fact, if you believe all the things that you believed five years ago, you're not studying the Bible enough. You need to be growing all the time learning beyond what you knew five years ago, learning what you knew one year ago. 
Continue to let the Word of God study you. When you study the Word of God, it's supposed to be studying you, and you're supposed to be letting it. Every time you open your Bible, you need to be willing to let God change you. And the first area in which he says we need to be changed is on being united. And so that's what we're going to talk about in Ephesians 4. They told us in school back in 73 to 75, they said, if you preach your sermon and Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, doesn't apply to your sermon, change your sermon. <laughs> he says, no, you don't use it every week, but it better apply to it. Because when the church gets together, we're to encourage the body of Christ to grow together in unity. We've got to be one. We've got to be one. So let's read the passage. Ephesians 4, starting in verse 1. We talked about his prayer. Isn't that a great prayer? In uh, 3, 14 through 21. Well, now we're going to look at the body that's supposed to be doing that praying. He says, I therefore, because I bow my knee to the Father, for all of this that we could know the love of Christ and had the power working in us because of the love of Christ in us. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Those three verses Tell us about the attitudes that we need to have in our lives if we want to have unity as one united body of Christ. Okay, I got one head on my body. Guess what? So do you. It wouldn't be good if I had two. I know they say two heads are better than one, but that means two heads with two bodies, okay? Uh, you don't want two heads on your body. You just want one head on your body. Christ only wants one body under his head. I don't want two bodies under my head. And so he says, I want one body and one head. And here he says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord. So he's kind of appealing to them because he's in jail when he writes this. Okay, I want you to walk worthy of your calling. If you want to be united... Try to walk worthy of your calling. Jesus called you to be the body of Christ. Jesus called you to be the bride of Christ. Jesus called you to be a holy priesthood. Jesus called you, you know, all those things that he said for we're supposed to be, walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you have from Christ. Get serious. Okay? If you get a job promotion at work, you have to act differently. I remember I, on my third or fourth promotion, I think it was my fourth promotion when I was in engineering at Nordstrom Corporation. Uh, I had to start wearing a tie to work. I had to, you know, start wearing dress shoes and dress slacks. And it was, it was crazy, you know. That wasn't the way I used to work when I was in the, in the, in the fab and down in the, or down in the uh, lab doing the inspection work uh, or in the nozzle room learning, doing inspection work in there. Now I got to wear a tie to work and I'm, I'm a different person. It's a different job because... They expect things of you. When God makes you his child, walk in a manner worthy of the calling that you've received. You live differently because of the calling you've received. Okay, officers in the military have a different calling, have a different responsibility than they did when they were enlisted men. He says, walk in a manner worthy of your calling. Okay, to which you've been called with all humility. Now, you want to really get along with each other? It starts with humility. Humility is not thinking highly of yourself. That's pride. It's not thinking lowly of yourself. That's self-abasement. Jesus doesn't walk around saying, I'm no good, I'm not worth anything. He said, in humility, okay, and gentleness. Gentleness isn't weakness. It's being under control of your master. A gentle horse is not weak, but he's under the control of his master. With all humility, and gentleness with patience, patience, put up with it, put up with it, okay, with patience, bearing with one another in love. You don't bear with one another because you have to. You bear with one another because you love them, and you show that love to them. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We want to have 
a life that makes the body of Christ united, not through our power, but through the Spirit who makes us one. We're related. We've all got the Spirit. We're going to go on from there uh, next week and look at the facts of unity and then the progress of how to develop that in our lives. But that's going to be next week. You have a great day. May God richly bless you and Jesus give you peace in your believing.